Starting back in 2018, the same year Digimon Hacker's Memory would release in the US, Digimon Survive was announced. The game was looking to be a more stylized 2D game, taking inspiration from strategy RPGs and visual novels. A unique concept and nothing out of the ordinary as Digimon experiments often with their games. It was also an exciting prospect. I'm a fan of Fire Emblem and Final Fantasy Tactics, so this was something I was looking forward to since day one. Digimon Survive being a more simple, and even according to developers, more indie-inspired 2D game was originally intended to be a passing game akin to Hacker's Memory, or basically a smaller scale game to help bridge the gap between major releases and giving players something to experience in the meantime. But somehow, this modest, smaller scale 2018 reveal would take until 2022 to release the missed delays and other mishaps, effectively jamming up the Digimon release cycle to, well, now. So you might be wondering what happened. Well, to sum it up quickly, it was a deadly one-two punch for any developer. The game started off as a smaller scale title, but grew in both budget and ambition until it was found needed to restart the whole project with a different team, with more expectations and pressure on a whole new engine. That's fine, these things happen, and if there's one silver lining, Habu Kazumasa said the new team was more on board with what the game's vision was, however keep in mind the timeline in regards to the second punch. This shift happened during the pandemic which caused a whole load of developmental problems, and what started as a cute, inoffensive way for Digimon to explore a new genre became a four year wait. During this time, fans didn't even know if the game would even come out or if it would randomly be cancelled. But early in 2022, it was not only confirmed to be alive, but coming out just months away. Witnessing its news cycle throughout 2022 was also certainly jarring too, as Digimon fans were excited to finally get a new game, but non-Digimon fans were confused and even many on the day of release were surprised to hear there even was a new Digimon game, not to mention many of both parties not knowing it was a visual novel. But regardless of its survival, hectic news cycle, and developmental period, at the end of the day the most important question is, was the wait worth it and did the game come out good? Let's just get into it. Digimon Survive is a visual novel and strategy RPG, emphasis on the visual novel part. In fact, to just describe its genre ratio immediately, imagine it as an entire visual novel, but whenever action and combat begins, it just uses strategy RPG gameplay to represent those battles. Meaning combat only happens when the story demands it, or occasional free battles you can choose to do in each area. No being in the middle of dialogue, then getting hit by a random encounter, or something like that. This is a point of contention for a lot of people, but I didn't mind this at all, and even somewhat enjoyed it. It was like watching an episode of the Digimon anime, going through all the twists and turns of the episode, and at the end, instead of watching the battle play out, I was the one in control. As a way to explain it directly, this entire game is just an interactive Digimon anime season, and as a fan of a lot of the old Digimon animes, I genuinely enjoyed enjoyed it. It was like having a brand new show that I was the one in control of and pushing the action forward. So even though it is mainly a visual novel, it gave me a strong sense of direction and interactivity you need in a game devoid of formal action. But then that brings the problem that if you're not a fan of Digimon storytelling, and are more in the series for the gameplay side, you're not guaranteed to enjoy it. The story, setting, and atmosphere is the reason to be here. The strategy gameplay is fun, and it certainly has its moments, but it doesn't have the depth of a lot of other dedicated strategy games, and it's as good as it needs to be if that makes sense. There are mechanics like back attacks, elemental matchups, status ailments, AoEs, the works, but don't go into this game expecting it to be the next great SRPG, because it is focused on its visual novel experience. The bulk of survival will be standard visual novel presentation with backgrounds and character sprites, but in Survive's favor, this is a damn good looking visual novel. My footage doesn't do it total justice, since I skimp out on quality to save on hard drive space, but it looks really nice. The art style is great, and paired with what are animated and expressive sprites, camera work that bounces between characters giving what is a lot of text a sense of movement, and fantastically atmospheric backgrounds, it leads to presentation being surprisingly strong. I say surprisingly because it really struck me when I first started how nice it looked, and I streamed the game to a couple different groups of people, and the main consensus I got was most of them didn't expect it to look so good. If I were to criticize anything, I do think its backgrounds and occasional event CGs could use more variety. There's a lot of generic wood reuse, and some scenes don't properly describe what's actually going on in the story. Like I know it's a text-based game and imagination and all that, but it's also a visual medium, and I think it just a bit more detail in the backgrounds and some better or even more CGs could have made the total presentation pop even more. I will say though that the almost luminescent visual style paired with its straightforward and solid instrumental pieces lends a weirdly cozy vibe to the game. I mean, don't get me wrong, it hits when it needs to both visually and musically to play into the survival aspect, but I kept this game on a lot without playing it because the backgrounds and music just were pleasant to have on. The gentle light lowering into the school building or woods while serene instrumental music played was just nice.
Opposing all this on the combat side, it shifts to a more traditional SRPG look with characters in Kimono Gami taking on chibis to fit the style, and I like it. Maybe it's because I'm a big JRPG guy where stylistic shifts and contrasts are a genre staple, but I'm always a fan of games that play around with their visual styles, and it even gives you a rest from the traditional VN look. In combat, you utilize your main character's Kimonogami partners, and free Kimonogami you can recruit SMT style by giving them answers they like. Kimonogami have different movement types, elements, and even all have a signature attack, alongside all the basics I spewed out before. There is strategy in who you choose, and even main character partners can bring specific tamer skills that add even more options. For example, Minoru's partner is Falcomon, whose evolution line has large movement, and Minoru himself can even buff the movement range of Falcomon or other Kimonogami. I'm not gonna go into the different characters until later in the video, but for now, you can also deepen your bonds with them via dialogue to have their partners evolve further and become stronger. This can even allow combat bonuses like restoring health or SP mid-combat. I'm always a fan of Digimon stories where it feels like the side main characters play a role and the fact your party can comprise entirely of main character mons who can all evolve on par for the super special main character Agumon is always a treat as well, since Digimon was a series notorious for shafting side characters sometimes in lieu for the special Goggle and Edgy Boys. That said, I kinda wish gameplay was just partner mons. I mentioned Free Kimonogami before, and this is how Survive appeals to the general Digimon fan, by giving them the option to raise some of their favorites and have more options in combat, but honestly, I kinda dislike this. It feels like almost an insecure move on the part of the developers because they weren't sure if people would like to use the main cast mons, but it provides some awkward design aspects for me. For one, it allowed them to make some rather questionable imbalance in regard to the party's evolution trees. They justify with the option of free Komodogami to balance it out, but my brothers and Agumon you made the game just adjust the types of the main party if you need to. It's also weird because free mons have quite expensive lines, having multiple potential megas giving them a lot of versatility as you evolve them. And even weirdly enough, they can evolve into extra copies of your main character's partners. There's even some mons that are limited to your party, only New Game Plus runs, which are then trivialized because you could just get those mons via free mons in the main game, which is just stupid to me. They are weaker than your main partners, but the differences aren't huge. My solution to this would only allow one of each Freemon per run, and restrict their trees to their own exclusive lines of one or two megas max to get the Freemons a feeling of variety and exclusivity while also not infringing on your own party. Like if Betamon could evolve purely into the Seedramon line, but only it can, so it still feels special. If it seems like I'm being really arbitrary about this, I am, as my medically diagnosed autism chose to single out this, and my original draft didn't have this, but I added it in the night before recording because once again, to me the system feels like a cope from the developers to try to appeal to people who didn't like changes in this game. I understand going to a new genre is hard, but if you do, you have to commit to it and you just can't do things halfway. I don't know how to end this, so I'm just gonna move on. Like the Sleuth duology, Kimonogami have different types, but instead of vaccine, data, and virus, there's moral, compassion, umami, and wrath. Like before, moral beats wrath, wrath beats compassion, and compassion beats moral. So there is still some strategy in typings. The game also showers you with combat skills for type matchups, healing items, new equipment, and stat boosting items just for basic exploration, so combat should never be an issue, aside from maybe some major boss fights which can turn up the challenge a little bit. I did actually not use a lot of these at first since I wanted the gameplay to be challenging and interesting to engage me, but if a fight is ever really overwhelming, you can always utilize those things or if you get desperate, lower the difficulty and it becomes a complete and utter joke where the strategy would become more how would you even possibly lose these fights. This isn't once again to say it's bad, and I still enjoyed these, but it's certainly not a dedicated SRPG. It hits all the boxes it needs to to be as good as it needs to be. I never really felt bored as it did occasionally throw battles I had to at least minimally engage in, and it rarely ever felt unfair aside from a few battles here and there across the two routes I played. It also had combat speed up whenever I just wanted to get through battles as well. However, I also never felt as engaged as let's say the aforementioned Fire Emblem and Final Fantasy Tactics titles. I think battles truly benefit the game as a means to break up the story, both mechanically with combat and also visually with the in-battle sprites, and to help with the game's flow, especially considering it put you in control of the action. Battles in Survive are ultimately a vehicle for the story, and the best maps in the game are the ones that play into the narrative well. The story of Survive is close to that of the original Digimon adventure, featuring a bunch of kids from camp getting sucked into another world. At the camp, we have our goggle-wearing hero Takuma, Minoru the good nature class clown, Aoi a responsible upperclassman, Ryo an antisocial punk, Saki a bubbly friendly girl, and Shuji an older kid acting as a counselor. Also in the area is the sibling pair Kaito and Miyu, and the professor who is studying local Kimonogami myths. At a glance, it seems like even with just the cast design, there is a lot of similarities to the original adventure. 
and indeed survive references and uses ideas from a lot of older Digimon properties. However, almost none of these are derivative and are used in fresh new ways. Like, while Kaito seems reminiscent of Matt or Shuji to Joe, their character personalities and arcs couldn't be more different and they simply occupy a similar archetype. You can start to see a lot of these divergences immediately by looking into these characters' bios and understand why they're at camp in the first place. For example, Takuma came to camp not because he really wanted to, but because he knew the trip would be good for him both educationally and experience-wise. It shows immediately that he's a person with good judgement, but also has a hint of ambivalence. As he really didn't go to camp out of a desire to do so, showing how his actions can eventually lead to different route outcomes. Shuji seems like a responsible guy at first, but he's really only here to get more things on his resume for college applications and only wants to keep things together so he looks good in the end. Ryo is another example as despite his antisocial personality, he came to camp to make friends at the behest of his departed mother. These motivations not only give a good amount of depth to the characters, but determine where they'll go in the story. Through a sequence of events, the campers alongside Kaito, Miu, and the Professor find themselves stranded in the Kimonogami world. The opening prologue of the game is this fantastic descent from a typical day at camp in the peaceful countryside to being stuck in a dangerous world. If you're like me and listen to all the dialogue, read the bios, and look for optional stuff, this prologue can take up to an hour before you even see a single Kimonogami, and I love it. It really takes its time to set up the setting, characters, and most importantly, atmosphere. By the end of the prologue, you're on the edge of your seat knowing that at any moment now, a Kimonogami is going to pop out of the wall and throw everything into chaos. Now if you're wondering why I'm calling them that, it's simply because these aren't Digimon, they're Kimonogami. Survive goes for a different interpretation on the concept and is instead, executing them as yokai-like spirits inhabiting this area of Japan, and we've been sucked into the spirits' world. That's also why their typings have changed from the more digital ones from before into the new moral compassion and raft typings, much more fitting of their spiritual identity. I love this as a new interpretation and it just feels like a fresh version of the concept of Digimon. I will say though, I kinda wish they went all in and only used natural Digimon or adapted ones that were mechanical. For example, I know we have to have Metal Greymon, but they could have given him a stone or a wooden claw to make him fit better. I really don't mind too much, but it would have been an extra detail that I think could have made this game even better akin to the desire earlier for more CGs and backgrounds. It's the little details like these that act as the whipped cream and cherry on top of truly refining a game. Each of our humans trapped in the Kimonogami world are bestowed a partner that battles and works alongside them, and these choices are... absolutely fantastic. Sure, we have Agumon, Falcomon, and Lotmon, all Digimon who have been given the spotlight, but we also have Kunamon, Floramon, Drachmon, and Siakumon, normally sidelined or villain Digimon finally given the main character treatment. We also have Labramon who is a fairly new Digimon as well. Even Falcomon takes on a new evolutionary path than its anime counterpart too. Agumon itself can also take divergent paths from the typical Greymon line as your alignment choices determine evolution. The more niche Digimon being given the spotlight was a purposeful choice on the part of the developers and it's something I fully commend them for and want to see more in future titles. Digimon has stayed a bit too comfortable with overusing certain mons and I'd love to see them utilize more of their monster catalog in future games for main leads. These Kimonogami are also characters, they act as both partners but also reflections of their tamers. For example, Falcomon is a formal and heroic Kimonogami who helps keep Minoru in line. Minoru himself seeks to become a heroic person and that desire is what resulted in Falcomon's personality. Later on, we also see how petty and immature Falcomon can be as well, resulting in Minoru needing to mature to restore their friendship, bringing it full circle. It's simple and direct, but I really like it, and all the partners do such a great job at reflecting their tamer's personalities both on the surface and on a deeper level and even their evolutions reflect their partner's growth. For example, Kunamon is a kind and reliable Kimonogami, but unlike the other Kimonogami is illiterate, showing how Ryo himself is a good guy deep down, but has terrible communication skills. But eventually, upon evolving, Kunamon gains the ability to speak, showing how Ryo has grown as a person. Due to the nature of most previous games being RPGs of variable Digimon, party members couldn't have actual character. But here, all of the partners are important members of the group and it helps give the game a different flavor than the previous ones. After the prologue throws everything into chaos, you're left with Takuma who is all alone in a dangerous and mysterious world, and the game establishes very quickly that this is not a Saturday morning cartoon, and these kimono kami mean business. Even the initial meeting with Koromon holds a level of weight and we just don't know what's going to happen and Takuma actively distrusts the little blob at first. A lot of survive is characters reacting to and assessing the situations they are currently in. 
which is natural given the setting and story is a bunch of teens getting stranded in a mysterious world where most of its denizens want them dead. Despite not really knowing anything, Takuma is able to partner up with Koromon to eventually regroup with some of the others and find an abandoned school building reminiscent to the one they stayed at during camp. The school is, however, haunted and overran by Tokukamon, who kidnapped the party one by one with the intent of killing them, and at the end of the chapter, Takuma is able to trigger Agumon's evolution and defeat Tokugamon. Now when I go over this chapter, it seems pretty simple if not once again reminiscent of what you would find in a Saturday morning cartoon. The characters are thrust into an unfamiliar setting, reunite, think they've found a familiar and safe place, only to be attacked by villains and achieve victory through anime friendship powers. However, this is where I think I need to make something clear. Survive isn't made great by the broad strokes, but by the little ones. There are great story events spread throughout, but the real spice of this game is the little moments. For example, while investigating the school building, we get to see each of the characters' reactions to the current events, like Ryo losing his shit and Minoru trying to put on a strong act. We also get to experience exploring the abandoned building alone with our Agumon, and even see some more questionable supernatural events to add on to the already excellent and creepy atmosphere. A lot of the optional dialogue, exploration, and little character moments make what is a pretty standard first chapter a lot more interesting. If there's one thing I can say about games that go through dev hell is that they usually have some pretty good openings because there's just one dude in the corner working on it for several years while everyone figures out what the hell is going on with the later game. But I also think this is another reason why the game is a tough sell is that to get everything out of Survive you kind of have to read all of it. All the little details and slight exploration add a lot to the total. So if you aren't already into the game's writing or Digimon storytelling, you may not have a good time and it will only be aggravated by how much you have to take your time with it. Especially because this game is also rather chunky and fairly long for a visual novel. I had comments on earlier Digimon videos and also just from looking around for my research saw a lot of people hated this game's story, and a lot of these people mentioned or implied they used text skip. Which if you do that, you're gonna decimate this game's experience. I quite enjoyed my first time through, but on my second playthrough for another ending, I used text skip a lot to save time, and oh my god, this just kills the pacing and atmosphere and subtle characterization. Now obviously if you're a fast reader like me, you don't have to listen to whole voice lines if you want to get a move on, but to outright skip sections of this game is to harm the experience. And I get it, this game's writing isn't for everyone and is far from perfect and if you don't like it, I understand. But at the same time, I feel like it's also been dragged heavily by a lot of people, especially those who just skipped over most of it. And as a person who did find the game absorbing, I want to try and rep the writing. For example, one thing that really stood out to me as I wrote notes from chapter to chapter is how each one stands out. The prologue is the descent from normalcy to being trapped into Komonogami world. Chapter 1 is navigating the world, regaining some balance and meeting your partner. Chapter 2 is traveling around the immediate area, gaining more grounds for survival like using the school as a home base as well as considering food and water, while culminating in meeting more stranded characters. And even after that, chapters will have you go to places like a rundown amusement park or getting trapped in a waterway full of hallucinations and traps. It does a good job of keeping the story moving, but also making each chapter feel substantial and each place a part of the journey. You don't always know what will happen next. The main crux of the adventure will be our characters attempting to survive in the Komonogami world, while also figuring out a way to escape. I also like how the group has a good dynamic. Despite Takuma being the lead, there's a lot of back and forth between characters on what to do next or what the best course of action will be, making it feel like a genuine group trying to survive. For example, Aoi usually keeps everyone in consideration, while Kaito is usually apt to take more brash and direct approaches. This back and forth also helps explain why the game is the same for most of it, as decisions are generally made on a group consensus and not the actual player. This is the type of game where its route split takes place near the end of the game. Throughout the game, you have dialogue choices that go between moral, compassion, and rap. It may not be the easiest to explain, but rap is usually brash or direct actions, compassion is usually sensible choices, and moral goes back and forth between sensible choices or brainless anime protagonist choices. Once you reach a certain point, the game will decide your path by giving you a choice between your top two alignments. On the one hand, it's nice because it means getting more endings goes faster so you don't need to replay the game as many times, but on the other hand, you can technically take mostly one choice, but then also, because you have some slight points in another, pick it by liberty of it being the second highest. This feels genuinely cheap. I feel like this game is in this awkward spot between wanting to tell a focused narrative, but also stretching itself to have different paths like other VNs. The problem is most other VNs usually handle routes a lot more naturally by making them the direct result of the player's actions or by locking in routes early into the story so they can develop naturally. 
Now let me say my first route, the Moral Route, ended up being a great time as it has the best balance between survives darker and lighter tones. Using its stressful and dark early game to springboard into a more hype end game, and it was my favorite route. And if you reach the route split and are unsure of which to take, it's my own personal recommendation, especially if you're a straightforward brainless Digimon fan like me. But if you're feeling compassion or wrath, feel free to go down them out of your sick curiosity to see what happens, because let me say that while they should have split earlier, they do swing hard in what time they're given. I normally don't like to do spoilers, it's something I need to get more comfortable with, but especially for something like Survive that is mostly story, I've been really hesitant to give more than crumbs to not hamper the experience for anyone else, because you really do need to go in blind. But for once, I am going to do a spoiler section talking about the routes and endings, so skip to this point to not get spoiled. I'll give you all a moment. So, uh, how's the weapon? Like I said, the moral ending is what I consider to be the best, as it uses the game's forced deaths to contrast with a hype ending and a natural transition of Komonogami into formal Digimon. Forced deaths is in Ryo and Shuji, whose deaths are handled spectacularly and had me at the edge of my seat and ripped out my heart. I can relate to both characters a lot, with Ryo having a tough time making friends and Shuji feeling the need to prove himself. Both of their respective deaths are set up throughout Chapter 3 and 5 and play of the player's expectations, Ryo's especially being the first one. I've been using the anime comparison all episode, but here it's used at its strongest. Throughout the chapter you want Ryo to turn around, have his anime moment, have Kunamon evolve and grow as a person, like an episode of the show. But instead on that moment you would normally triumph, he just gives up on life and dies. Similar with Shuji, you think he'll finally overcome his own insecurities and shape up, but instead his dark feelings evolve Lotmon into Wendigomon who goes berserk and kills him. Instead of stock, triumphant resolutions, they simply die due to their own weakness in this more brutal, non-shiny anime world. The pacing of these characters' deaths are magnificent, and no other story I experienced throughout all of last year even gets close to these moments. This is why I also think the moral route works best of the story, as no one else dies and the remaining characters are able to overcome the earlier game's darkness with a brighter endgame that still has an edge to it, because players don't know that no one else dies at that point. Larger casts lead to more small moments and stronger interactions and being able to develop everyone more, and I'm always a sucker for Omnimon blasting his way through the endgame. And just in general, I'm pro teens not dying in a horrible yokai world. I'm a little controversial in that way, but I stand by it. And the moral ending having a Digimon title drop the credits is pure, raw, Kino. Now on the compassion route, Miyu will die as well and have Kaito leave in anger, becoming an antagonist. And in the Raph route, Saki will die and leave Aoi a dark biomerge Plutomon attempting to suffer off reunion this shit. Now are Miyu and Saki's deaths built up incredibly well the same way Ryu and Shuji's are? Playing with our expectations and then goring out our hearts? Well, no, they just kinda die. Instead of Miyu dying because of her traumatic past, or Saki dying because of her fear of her eventual surgery, they just kind of randomly die because the story needs an extra death. This means that at the end of the Wrath and Compassion routes, you only have four live characters because two are killed at a default, and two others because the route demanded it. I'm not saying these routes are bad, more just awkward because half the cast is gone, because two are forced, one is random, and the other is the eventual antagonist. They do transition well into the true route, unlocked after the main campaign which saves every character making it a great contrast to the Wrath and Compassion routes and better for those players to get the whole cast, but still, the true ending, despite having Ryu and Shuji live and being my favorite characters in the game, and still well worth playing just for them, kinda sucks. At the end, it becomes Find the Sovereign Digimon, which is generic as opposed to earlier chapters and other routes, which were filled with mystery and fear. But this is just generic. Go to place, fight thing, repeat three times, credits. I will say this does weirdly enhance the normal three endings, as it has the group survive in those scenarios with half the information, making it feel like a true survival, and not a traditional clean triumph. And I cannot believe the ending being a Demi Vivon reference is just... it's just terrible. And I hate it. Imagine having a true ending, but instead of telling us where our characters are and what they're doing, especially for two who don't live in the other endings, they do a cheap Digimon 2 reference and that's it. No Ryo going to his mother's grave with Kunamon and memories of his friends, or Shuji kicking his dad in the nuts with Lotmon. Just here's your cheap Digimon 2 reference, we didn't have enough time to finish this game, XD! Personally, I think the route split should have been at the end of Chapter 3, and have maybe two routes per death dependent on that. Like if you do the Moro or Raph route, you have the ability to save Ryo, but if you choose Compassion, you're too passive to help him. Likewise, maybe have Shuji die in the Moro route because he's jealous of Takuma's leadership skills preventing him from coming around. 
then have the routes be based on the different philosophies of moral, wrath, and compassion throughout them as well. It would have resulted in a much better story that felt more natural, and the deaths would have been more meaningful. However, with all that said, and despite my complaints, I still obviously did enjoy my time with the story. All the intrigue of the Kimonogami, these flawed kids working together in a dangerous world to succeed, the tension, the drama, the atmosphere, and all the feelings throughout, the experience was just absorbing through and through. And you know what? I'm happy Survive finally came out and I got to experience it. This game hit my Digimon anime itch more than my video game one, but I still liked it, and it lit a Digimon fire that hasn't burned so strong in me for a long time. Not even Sleuth, Hackers, or Next Order did this as strongly. In fact, since playing Survive, I've watched some of the anime series again, and have even played through Digimon World 1. If you're a fan of any type of Digimon storytelling, you'll like this game. If you're not, but you seem interested in it, I'd say wait for a sale if you can. Not because I'm unconfident in the game, just that it's definitely hit or miss, and I'd rather people play it safe. And honestly, I've waited long enough for, like Sleuth, it's going on sale like every other month. And I care about your guys' wallets. It certainly is a Digimon game of all time. It's flawed, but also charming, but also divisive, but also dumb, but also unique and plucky. So basically, it's like every other Digimon game pre Cyber Sleuth, and it's a welcome addition to the series catalog. I don't think it'll be as popular as Sleuth, but it'll develop a strong, dedicated fanbase over time. And you know what? If I can come out with one thing from this, it's that for what it's worth, this game's initial harsh reception led to a resurgence of a lot of Digimon fans speaking up for it. It was once again a good reminder that this series' fans are really great and just passionate about it. And going forward, we have Next Order being ported into new systems, and hopefully new projects to be announced soon for the series as well. As for me, I'm gonna focus on new projects myself by moving away from Digimon to other things for a while. But don't worry, I'll still cover Digimon games from time to time, especially once those new games come out. Like, review them a half year later because I've lost all control of my life. Thanks for watching, and if you somehow made it to the end of the video, Thank you so much, I really do appreciate it, and I promise to release videos again more consistently with at least one a month, but only time will tell. Have a fantastic day, take care, and let me know if there's any game you want me to cover. Till next time, my friends.